Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. Way back in the old days of May 2018, I came across an old server that had two CPU sockets. This was a pretty unique thing to me back in the day, and so I bought it without thinking much of it. I also took it apart and used the components without thinking too much of it. The two CPUs I found inside it were my Xeon E5420s, which I used for a little while in my secondary gaming rig. But the rest of the system was soon to be deceased, as when I attempted to bring the system back together for a nice family reunion, I killed the motherboard. But since then, I've always wanted to put together a beautiful workstation worthy of respect from even the most devoted tech enthusiasts. That is, if they're a fan of history. No way I'd be buying a modern workstation with my shoestring budget. So instead, I turned to the used market, and I managed to find, after months of searching for the perfect specimen, this beauty here. An HP XW8400 workstation PC. Now, I'm not terribly sure when this piece of hardware was introduced to the market, but we can take a look both inside and outside the case to see if we can figure some things out about it. The XW8400 is an overall very aesthetically pleasing workstation. It has a certain heft to it that even some modern gaming desktops just can't seem to meet. You can tell that the case was designed to be as robust as possible, too, as it has plastic and metal reinforcements surrounding the metallic insides. The front of the case is one of the parts that really shows off this system's heft. I love the plastic shroud on the front. It shows that HP really took airflow into consideration when they designed this system. As for I.O., we have two USB 2.0 ports, front panel audio, and even firewire, which isn't something you usually see on front panels. There is a disk drive here, though there is room for more in the system. There are some stickers that show us more about what's inside the system as well. There's an Intel Xeon inside sticker, and a Windows XP sticker. That suggests that this workstation was likely manufactured before 2009 when Windows 7 was released to the public. On the backside, we have a decent assortment of I.O., but it's not really anything to write home about. We have five USB 2.0 ports, as well as PS2 ports, Firewire, and Gigabit Ethernet. No display outputs are present on this motherboard, meaning that the chipset likely doesn't have integrated graphics. On the side panel, there's a small locking mechanism. Thankfully, the workstation came with a set of keys for opening it, so we have no problem getting to the internal components to see what's inside. The inside of the workstation is an impressive sight. Unlike consumer desktop PCs, workstations are designed to be more end-user serviceable. Likewise, almost everything can be done quickly inside the case and without tools. First, let's take a look at this big, beefy fan heatsink thingy here. At first glance, this might be the CPU, or even the chipset with active cooling, but no. This is actually where the memory is located. When I bought this PC, it came with 4 gigabytes of memory, arranged into 4 DIMMs like so. You'll notice that these DIMMs are part of two separate kits. It's possible that the memory in this workstation was upgraded at some point during its heyday. Moving on to the graphics card, we have an ATI Fire GL with a workstation characteristic handle and locking mechanism. These parts were made to make the graphics card assembly as robust and as easy to service as possible. I was told that the VRAM in this card is a little bit flaky, so I likely won't be using this card for very long. Now, hard drive cages for workstations are a beautiful sight. These are toolless ones which allow the end user to insert and remove drives quickly and easily. I wish that HP would include these in their consumer systems today. I wish that like, all case manufacturers had these things in their cases. But I digress. We still have arguably the most important part of this workstation to look at. That would be the CPU. We have two LGA771 sockets on this motherboard, but only one of them is currently populated. We can remove this heatsink with a little bit of elbow grease to look at the CPU. And inside, we find a Xeon X5150. That's a dual-core processor clocked at 2.66 GHz. This CPU is unfortunately not a lot to write home about, even for its time. It's similar to a Core 2 Duo E6700, which really doesn't have much real-world applicability anymore. Lastly, I want to draw attention to this stamp on the side panel. This is a stamp of approval following a quality assurance test that was apparently done in May 2007. These letters here at the top might be some initials for the person that performed the test. So, based on all the things we've seen here, if I had to guess, this XW8400 workstation might have been used for graphically intensive tasks such as CAD modeling. Either that, or I'm really underestimating the power that dual-core CPUs had in 2007. But I have no option to underestimate the power of this workstation. This style and heft require respect even amongst modern users such as myself. It's my responsibility as a workstation owner to take good care of this machine from now on. As a display of affection towards my new beauty, I think it's a good time to give her some much-needed upgrades. I want to take advantage of the dual CPU sockets that she has, and use them to get as much performance as possible. In addition, I want to have good enough graphics performance that will give her the power to handle modern gaming titles, but within the constraints of the CPUs. No matter what CPUs I choose, there might be some bottlenecking in this system. 
That's why I went all out with the most powerful workstation processors available on this platform. Two Xeon X5365 CPUs clocked at 3 GHz will be the heart and soul of this metallic workhorse. These quad-core processors will be combined to give the system eight true cores of computing power. I will also be adding 4 GB of DDR2 ECC memory that I happen to have left over from messing around with the server that I dismembered nearly a year ago. That leaves us with 8 GB of memory to play around with, which should be plenty for gaming and some productivity in this day and age. That said, our motherboard can still support up to 32 GB of memory, and the ECC variety is relatively cheap, so there will be some upgrade potential here. Finally, for the graphics card, I will be adding this GTX 1050 Ti from EVGA. I personally feel like I could be adding a better constructed GPU that is more deserving of being inside a prestigious workstation, but this will have to do for now. Here's our workstation now that has all the upgrades we've put into place. I'm also outlining the specs as well as the prices of all the components for an overview. Now that we've gotten the upgrade covered, it's time to focus on the benchmarks. This is a workstation PC after all, and having been built for processing power, I think it's only fair that we should stress these CPUs as much as possible. It's our goal to see what these CPUs can really do in this day and age. So let's begin with the usual Cinebench R15. Here, our dual Xeon X5365 earns an average multi-core score of 560. A single-core score of 72 suggests decent-ish gaming performance for budget users, but honestly this number is a bit disappointing. Compared to the Core 2 Quad Q9505 that I tested in a previous video, these CPUs have very similar single-threaded performance, so I expect gaming performance will still be acceptable. Passmark CPU Mark gave the dual Xeons an overall score of 5994 and a single threaded score of 1183. Again, we can compare this to the Q9505 to show that single threaded performance is similar, but the multi threaded performance is nearly doubled. 7zip gives us an interesting result, where the compression abilities of the dual X5365s are almost but not quite double to what the Q9505 can achieve. A MIP score of 22072 shows similar multi-threaded performance to some modern processors. In Asus RealBench, the dual Xeon scored overall with a 63613, earned a 77901 in image editing, an 86707 in encoding, and a 79683 in heavy multitasking. Interestingly, the dual Xeon scored significantly lower than the Q9505 in the image editing test. These four CPU benchmarks help display a lot of things that the CPU is capable of, but I think there are some other things we could hope to know about this system. We still want to know how the thing games, don't we? I've tested a few more games this time to get a measure of performance in a range of titles. First up, we have GTA V, in which the workstation saw an average of 46 FPS and a low of 20 FPS. These are decently playable numbers, and thankfully, unlike when I tested the Athlon 2x4630, all game assets looted into place when they needed to. Unfortunately, PUBG isn't this machine's favorite game to run. While the average frame rate it saw was in the high 40s, the 1% low FPS shows that the gaming experience playing PUBG on the system wasn't exceptional with stutter and busy areas. This especially applies when jumping out of the plane at the start of the match. Rise of the Tomb Raider's built-in benchmark tells a very similar story to PUBG, with an average FPS of 36 being more or less playable to a budget gamer. That said, the low FPS being just 7 shows that we had some stutter in areas we might not have liked to see them. Some game assets also failed to load into place during the Geothermal Valley section of the benchmark, meaning that in fast-paced, action-packed moments, this game might not play very well on the upgraded workstation. In CSGO, the upgraded workstation saw an average FPS of 61, with a 1% low of 34 FPS. Gameplay was smooth and aiming was responsive. These are plenty playable numbers, however with the dual CPUs being taxed the whole time, I find it unlikely that these numbers can be pushed up much further. The gaming experience with Overwatch was pretty nice, with an average FPS of 61 to satisfy the most demanding budget gamers. That said, we did see some stutter with a 1% low at 19 FPS. Thankfully, this didn't retract from the gaming experience too much, but the lag might have caused me to die or miss a shot a little more than I would have liked. Lastly, we have the game that I grew up with, Team Fortress 2, in which the workstation earned an average FPS of 53. Like with Overwatch, a 1% low in the mid-teens shows us that there was some stutter in areas where we might not have liked to see it, but I feel as though this detracted a bit less from the overall gameplay. Okay, so the benchmarks we've seen today show that the upgraded XW8400 workstation is a computational powerhouse, but it isn't extremely keen on gaming. It gets the job done, but in more demanding AAA titles, this old girl may not have what it takes to keep churning out the frames. That said, I think there's still a lot we can learn from this system. I was intrigued by the huge gains in multi-threaded performance that we had by adding a second processor. 
I haven't done a full suite of benchmarks on this yet, but a friend of mine ran a 7-zip benchmark on his system with a Core i7-6700, which was only barely able to beat out the dual Xeons. I want to investigate this further, and I intend to make this the focus of a second part of a video on the XW8400 workstation. As always, this project was an absolute pleasure to work on. You guys, my viewers, you are the people that help make these sorts of projects worth doing. Please like the video if you liked it, or drop a dislike add on it if you didn't. Also, if you like this sort of content and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to the channel. You can also hit the notification button to get instant alerts whenever I upload a video. So, this is going to do it for today, guys, but don't worry, there's still more about this system for you guys to look forward to. I'll be signing off for today, but I'll be seeing you soon.